professors come and tell you it's all about principles. And, uh, and I think oh, we should dwell on that at some point. Um, we were both laughing, but maybe it's because we're only sort of uh, fit at the law school, but increasingly so, I think. Um, so it's really exciting for me to have a chance uh, to be part of this discussion and to be an initial part of a discussion that you will uh, be having in your uh, dialogue groups. Um, and as we look to all that's before us and all the opportunities that you were talking about this morning and the challenges for restorative justice, I think one of those challenges is the question laid before us this morning uh, by Mr. Paragoff. There will be lots of people looking to ask us questions about what we do and to seek to understand and how do we make that understanding uh, deep and not surface. So I literally was laughing this morning. I got in the taxi cab to come here um, and he said, so why do you work there? I'm like, no. What are you doing today? <laughs> I'm at uh, the conference. What's the conference about? And here we go. It's about restorative justice. And I swear to you, he said to me, so how do you define that? <laughs> elevator pitch, really. Um, and I think we know as a community that the elevator pitch on restorative justice has always been a challenge. I don't think it's just because I've lived for a long time in Halifax, and you may have noticed we don't have a lot of tall skyscrapers, so maybe my elevator's not long enough. I haven't even worked out the, the cab ride pitch yet, and that's, and that's longer. Um, and I think there's good reason that we shouldn't be really seeking to solve this marketing dilemma with an elevator pitch. It's a good reason to be uh, wary, I think, of the elevator uh, pitch. Um, but there's also good reason to realize that what the elevator pitch is trying to do is to make it um, understandable, right? To make it uh, recognizable. In the process, one of the risks, I think, is that we end up uh, spinning RJ in terms that are familiar to the existing system. Why? Well, because we, we want to sell people something they want to buy, or they could at least recognize enough to want to not get off the elevator. Uh, but we want to meet their expectations about justice. We want some kind of a hook, and yet we find ourselves with those expectations having been created by systems that are quite fundamentally different. So you know these arguments we wind up in, these, these initial like, it's not soft, it's really painful. And then we're like, actually that's the best thing that we want to encourage, because then we get really scared about what those processes look like when people think they could come to us to exact pain. Or we explain what it looks like uh, in the hopes of that slide says, sometimes it's easier to see than to say. So we try to describe what it looks like to help people grasp it. Um, we say, um, well, it's about sitting in circles, or we ask questions, we don't, we ask, don't tell. We bring people together to talk. All these things are true, but they lead us a little bit, I think, um, to this picture that people have, and people within the restorative justice movement, but mostly people out, that are restorative, uh, approach is really just a set of tools. It's about the practices. It's about the how do you organize the furniture, what question cards do you use, uh, what poster did you put on the wall, who gets invited, what's your checklist. It's one tool among many tools um, in terms of um, approaching what we do. So we do things differently, but we don't really address the issue that we actually think we're fundamentally doing something different, which is why we do it differently. We do use different tools and different practices and different processes. They are showing up in our systems in this conference, but we do them for a reason. Um, and it's not simply a practice. So if that fails, then we tell stories. So this, you can't read it, says, if they don't like our proposal, we'll show them the kitten. Everybody likes kittens. Um, and I think human stories are our most powerful way of communicating because they reach people in their head. <coughs> There's no accident that things that go viral on every social media we have are often those stories about uh, people and maybe kittens. But the things that people
people can connect to on a range of levels, which is telling us something really important about uh, the way that human beings learn and think and change. So I don't mean to diminish those good news stories. I do mean to say, though, that if that's the only way that we have of trying to get people to understand that deeper impact about a restorative approach, that we do risk uh, this risk of good news stories, is we, we risk the fact that it is unbelievable for people that this happens. There is a translation problem. Even when they want to believe it, they think it's unique to that set of circumstances or for those special people or happened there but couldn't happen here. Or this is this special kumbaya thing that they are as suspicious of as they are of a cult because it feels about as accessible to them. Right? What do I do? Do I have to drink the Kool-Aid in order to believe this is possible? So... I think perhaps even more than ever, we need to tackle uh, this problem. And we need to tackle it in a way that doesn't feed into these frustrations we have about the, the caricatures of a restorative approach being about all talk, no action, everybody hugging and passing Kleenex. Um, that we, we want people to be able to see the difference that restorative justice makes. And we know that they do when they experience it. Right? The empirical evidence tells us that people's satisfaction, people's belief in this, is actually changed um, if they haven't experienced the process. But man, that is a slow way to change hearts, minds, and public policy. Um, and maybe it's that those ways of interacting, those ways of working, need to show up more often in everything we do, and not just inviting people to the conferences or the circle processes in the community, or also doing it. So maybe it's gatherings like this, maybe it's disrupting other ways in which we work for public policy change um, so that people can experience that. But I think we also need some way to talk about it to help people process and understand what it is they're seeing. We don't want people to just take away the models, the, the ways of working, right? We want them to understand why we work in this way. We want them to be able to take away and think why is what I'm seeing and experiencing in justice just as relevant to securing just relationships in schools and in workplaces? And, and the thing that's transferable is not the way we arrange uh, the furniture. So we need, I think more than ever at this point, at this juncture, uh, to be able to talk to one another about our work and also to be able to critically assess when we're being our best, where we can grow and where we can learn from one another in a way that does more than just share our practice models with one another, but really gets behind them to what's underlying them. And I think that fits with what Scott was in, encouraging us to do this morning. So I think if we're going to do that, we need to be clear about what this restorative approach to justice is. Um, and I think it's fundamentally a different way of understanding justice, first and foremost. And, and I know that some of you, even in your circles, began to talk about this. You may be familiar with Simon Sinek. If you're not, he has a, a good TED Talk and a book called Starting With Why and a bunch of other resource materials, so um, you can Google them. In this case, I think he's helpful. He has this um, idea, and he admits it's a simple idea. He admits it's not actually his in terms of the importance of principle-oriented work. But he does make this interesting observation about our modern ways of doing things, explaining things, pitching things to people. And he says, organizations and people tend to work from the outside of this circle, which he calls the golden circle, in when explaining things. So we tell people what we do. We do restorative justice or conferencing or victim of mediation. Sometimes we get to the next layer where we get to tell them how we do it. We ask questions. We facilitate dialogue. We bring people uh, into encounter processes. But we almost never get, this is where the elevator gets too short or people's attention span um, can't withstand the enthusiasm with which you are describing what you think to them. We also never tell people why um, or what we believe. Right? What should compel people to see the value in these processes or practices or programs? What could help them believe this is worth doing or might work? So Senek's big line that he repeats is, uh, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you're doing it. So he says all great inspirational leaders and companies work from the inside of that circle out. So they start with the why. I don't think 
that we're selling. I don't think we should not try to sell our gym. But I do think if we want to transform people's thinking about justice so that we can work differently, then we have to stop telling them what we do or stop only telling them what we do to compel them or convince them, but instead to explain to them why we see the need to do these things in different ways. And then we need to hold ourselves to account for why we do things as well. So what does this mean uh, for restorative justice? Why do I think we do it? I think we do it because we believe that justice is fundamentally about just relationships. I think that this belief is rooted in a concept about the world, about who we are as human beings, about what we need from one another, a fundamental commitment to this idea that we are relational, that we live in and through relationships with others, and not just because that's how we organize the world, but because in fact we couldn't do differently. That is how we um, exist. And it's a story told in everywhere from medical science to physics to all of the major world religions and traditions. Um, and most profoundly for us here um, in Canada and elsewhere by indigenous peoples about um, their relationship with one another um, and with the land. And I mean by this significance of relationship, not just that we are in interpersonal relationships with one another, right? That this is about how we get along or we get along, but that this we're relational all the way down and all the way up to our institutions and our systems and our structures and how they are interconnected in ways uh, that fashion um, our lives. And I don't mean by this the hallmark reading card version of justice is that relationships are good. I think that we're acutely and painfully aware, and particularly in this time and space where we're tackling the challenge of reconciliation, that our relationships can be profoundly harmful, profoundly negative. They can be oppressive and violent and discriminatory. Those are ways of relating to. So it isn't that relationships are good, it's that they are. And if they are, we need to make that matter profoundly to what justice requires and how we do it. And from that basis of understanding what harms us in relationship, I think we can describe our ambition for restored relationships, for what justice requires in just relations. And they are relationships based on respect, concern, care, and dignity. So then this restorative approach, this relational approach, becomes an umbrella approach from which we can develop practices and processes and strategies and policies. So what do we need to do that? Well, I think we need principles. I don't think we need recipes, but this is my acknowledgement to you. The bottom says, oh my god, the salad's on fire. Uh, I don't think we need recipes to be good cooks. <laughs> this is my confession, I'm not a good cook. Uh, I can actually follow a recipe to cook. But if something goes wrong, then I'm stuck. Right? But then I have to call someone who really knows how to cook and can tell me what went wrong and why it doesn't work. But I think that the basic principles of cooking and of food science, found here at the foundational book, that says no written recipe can be 100% accurate. The judgment of the cook is still the most important factor. A cook's judgment is based on experience and understanding of the raw materials available, the basic cooking principles, and food science. So maybe relational theory is food science, and then we have to derive principles from it. So I want to suggest to you that we need principles for practice. We need principles to guide practice, and we need those principles to be those with which we can talk about what we do and guide what we do. And this, these may not be the only list, but I think these are some fundamental principles I want to offer you for your consideration in terms of how it might guide our work. And they look a bit different than the ones we typically see for restorative processes, which involve respect, which I think is both a fundamental ambition of just relations, but also respect and honesty and voluntariness. I think those are values that we need in order to make these principles work. Right? They are often things we describe in connection with how to make particular practices um, and so I'll say a bit more about how I think they fit. So the principles. I think the principles, and we could you know, pull any 
any one of them apart for uh, any amount of time. But I think these principles then will ring true out of a relational theory. So if it is about a relational approach, what does that mean? How does that show up? I think restorative processes have to be comprehensive and holistic. They can't be just about the incident. Just tell me the facts, ma'am. I don't care what happened the day before or the day after. We must <laughs> care what happened the day before and the day after and who else was impacted and involved. We must care about the context, causes, and circumstances if we are to understand the harms that are experienced, the reasons they happened, and what we do about it. We must stay relationship focused, not on one particular party. This is not about flipping the tables on an offender centered system to a victim centered one, but paying attention to the connections. And if we focus on relationships, we must work in contextual and flexible ways. We can't have the cookie cutter or the add water and stir um, process. I think we're committed to subsidiarities. I say all the time, so my proof that I'm a law professor. This is how our system of governance is organized. But that just means the people closest to the issue, those who have the most knowledge about the issue, should be involved directly in addressing the issue and having input. So that means we need to be inclusive. But we need to be inclusive. We need to think about who's affected in a much broader way. And then when we bring them in the room, it needs to make a difference that they're there. It can't be that we're inclusive in the way, just to pick one example, the duty to consult Aboriginal peoples is inclusive which is we've ticked a box and we've heard you, but we made sure it could make no difference to our decision what you said. So we need to be participatory. We need to be inclusive in radical ways. And I think that's where those values of how people show up, honesty, respect, um, voluntariness in a less um, um, strict sense are helpful and important. And we need to be future focused. We do care about what happened in the past, but we care about what matters about that for what happens next. So I think it's these principles of working restoratively that are going to uh, help us um, explain ourselves to one another. And I think it's particularly important because if we start talking about these grounding principles and the why they are rooted in, we can find our common cause and common space with others who think the same way about the need for change and justice. And so I very much look forward to hearing that tell us about uh, those principles that we also need to be thinking about to bring these um, approaches together.